Colorado, United States, 1874. On a freezing April morning, a lone figure staggered across a snow-covered landscape toward a small government outpost called the Los Pinos Indian Agency. The men inside the outpost were just sitting down to breakfast when the door was suddenly thrown open. In the doorway stood a wild man with rags on his feet and madness in his eyes. The man's name was Alfred Packer and he had been lost for over two months in the snowy mountains of Colorado. After explaining his situation to the men of the outpost, Packer was ushered inside and offered the men's unfinished breakfast. Packer ate his fill and then promptly vomited, explaining to his saviors he was close to starvation and that his stomach was unused to food of such quality. He then asked for a glass of whiskey and after a few drinks, told the men of the outpost just how he came to be there. Packer said he was hired by gold prospectors as a mountain guide for an ill-fated expedition. Gold had been found in northern Colorado, and the men who hired Packer wanted their chance to strike it rich, even if that meant traversing the mountains in the wintertime. Packer said he was snow-blinded at one point during the expedition and abandoned by his employers, who left him with only a knife and a rifle to defend himself. Packer said he survived for two months, eating nothing but roots and rosebuds, a claim which confounded the men of the outpost, who had rescued lost and starving men before. The man sitting at their table drinking whiskey looked nothing like the skeletal creatures they had saved in the past. Packer's face was bloated, his body thick and full. To the men of the Los Pinos Indian Agency, it looked like the rescued man had eaten well in the mountains. This is the story of Alfred Packer, the Colorado cannibal. A few months before, Alfred Packer joined the ill-fated expedition to prospect for gold in northern Colorado. But it was Packer who asked to join the prospectors, not the other way around. Packer had a horse and an old Colt revolver, but no money, no rifle, and no cold weather gear. What he did have was experience traveling through the Colorado mountains, or so he claimed when he offered the prospectors his services as a mountain guide. Packer had many occupations in his life. He was a soldier, a ranch hand, a miner, and a wagon teamster but his skills as a mountain guide left something to be desired. Winter that year was one of the coldest on record. The trail the men followed was covered in thick snow, which forced them to rely solely on their compasses for direction. Before long, they were hopelessly lost, and Packer's lack of experience became apparent to everyone. The prospectors ran so low on supplies, they were forced to eat horse feed, they would have eaten their horses next had they not stumbled upon a camp of friendly Ute Indians. Chief Moray, the leader of the Ute, was known as the white man's friend, and in keeping with his nickname, offered the starving prospectors food and shelter for the winter. The men took the chief up on his offer of food and shelter, but had no intention of staying the winter. They were anxious to get to their destination before the hordes of their fellow prospectors did. They departed the camp several weeks later, despite Chief Moray's strong advice that they should stay. Eleven men left the Ute camp, but split in two groups when the men could not agree on the direction they should take. Half of the men wanted to follow Chief Moray's directions, which circumvented the mountains by following a nearby river. The other half trusted Packer, when he said he knew a shortcut through the mountains. The prospectors parted ways, with one group following the river, and the remaining five men following Packer. For the latter, it would prove to be a fatal mistake. Packer and the men who followed him were inadequately provisioned, 
They had no snowshoes, few firearms, and little ammunition. Most importantly, they barely had enough food for the duration of their journey, which was supposed to take no more than two weeks. But for Alfred Packard, the journey would take over two months. When he was finally rescued, Packer stayed at the Los Pinos outpost for 10 days until he was strong enough to travel again. He decided to return to his home state of Pennsylvania and made his way to the nearest town to buy supplies for his trip. Packer spent lavishly with money from several wallets. He also drank heavily and when he did, gave conflicting accounts about what happened to the other men of the doomed party. One of the prospectors from the original expedition entered town and questioned Packer about what became of his companions. Packer claimed to have gotten his feet wet and frozen at one point during the journey and built a small fire to warm them. He said the other men had gone on ahead to forage for food, leaving Packer with a rifle to protect himself until they returned. Packer claimed the men never did and instead abandoned him to a fate of hypothermia and starvation. But the prospector who questioned Packer found his story odd. Why would the men leave their guide behind when no one else knew their way through the mountains? And why leave Packer to die with a rifle they would have desperately needed? The prospector threatened to hang Packer himself if he was lying, but Packer maintained that his companions had abandoned him. And since there was no way to verify Packer's story, the prospector reported his suspicions to the local authorities. By this time, the men who had followed Chief Ori's directions arrived safely at the Los Pinos outpost, where they learned that only one of their former companions had returned alive. When the men learned it was Alfred Packer, they were immediately suspicious. And when they heard the story Packer had told the men of the outpost, they knew something had gone terribly wrong in the mountains. The men they knew would have never abandoned a man to die, while Packer, they said, was capable of anything. Packer was preparing to leave for Pennsylvania when he was approached by authorities. They wanted to question Packer about the disappearance of the other prospectors, so they lured him back to the outpost by insisting he lead a search party to find the missing men. When they arrived at Los Pinos, Packer was confronted by the prospectors, who wanted to know how he came by the money he spent so lavishly in town. Just then, there was a knock on the door of the outpost. Two Ute Indians walked in with a basket, the contents of which had been discovered on a hill just outside the outpost. Inside the basket were strips of dried human flesh, what the Yup tribesmen called white man's meat. The horrified men of Los Pinos examined the findings and looked to Packer for an explanation. After a long silence, Packer hung his head and replied, It would not be the first time that people have been obliged to eat each other when they were hungry. According to Packer, the men of the doomed expedition ran out of food sooner than anticipated due to the harsh terrain and extreme cold. Soon they were starving, and it wasn't long before the men began to eye one another uneasily. Packer claimed he returned from collecting firewood one day to find the other men butchering the body of a man named Israel Swan. Packer admitted to joining the feast, seeing no harm in doing so, as the man was dead anyway. After several more days of hard traveling, the men ran out of human meat and were again starving. So Packer and three other men made a pact to kill and eat another of their party, a man by the name of Frank Miller. Frank was devoured, and another secret pact was made a few days later. James Humphrey was eaten next, and after him, George Noon. One by one, the men consumed each other, until only two were left, Alfred Packer and a man with a rifle named Shannon Bell. Packer claimed he and Bell made another pact, this time to swear that one would not eat the other. But after several days without food, 
Shannon Bell finally snapped and tried to club Packer over the head with the butt of his rifle. Packer claimed he drew his old Colt revolver and shot Bell twice in the stomach, watching the man fall dead in the snow. He drew his knife and fed on the body of Shannon Bell. Packer told the men of Los Pinos that he had grown to like the taste of human flesh and that in his experience, the portions of the meat around the breast were the most delicious. The remains of the missing prospectors were discovered after the snow melted. An artist traveling with the rescue party sketched the grisly scene as he found it. Israel Swan and Frank Miller were nothing more than bones, and Frank Miller's head was missing, presumably carried off by scavengers. George Noon and James Humphrey had been flayed of their edible flesh. They were no more than bloody skeletons, with bearded faces still intact. Shannon Bell was found with his torso dissected and his arms and legs stripped of flesh. His head had been smashed open, his brains spilled beside him. All five were found in the same spot, contradicting Packer's story that the men were killed and eaten many miles apart. Additionally, the five corpses still had their organs and a substantial amount of edible flesh leading authorities to further question Packer's contention that all men were killed and eaten as a matter of necessity. The bodies were taken to town for burial, and a warrant was issued for the cannibal's arrest. But by then, Alfred Packer had disappeared. The Colorado cannibal was discovered in Wyoming ten years later, when he was recognized by a man who once belonged to the group of ill-fated prospectors. Alfred Packer was arrested and charged with the murders of the five men. To these charges, he pled not guilty and defended his actions at trial. The fact that Packer had eaten his dead companions was of little consideration to the court, which was sympathetic to the harsh realities of survival in the wilderness. All were familiar with the story of the ill-fated Donner Party, which had been forced to resort to cannibalism after being trapped in the mountains during the wintertime. But Packer's story changed several times over the course of the investigation. In one version, the starving men died one after another of natural causes, and only then were they eaten by their companions. In another version, Packer claimed that Shannon Bell murdered all four men and then attempted to kill Packer, who had been forced to shoot him in self-defense. Unsurprisingly, the constant revisions to his story did nothing to help his case. Alfred Packer was ultimately convicted and sentenced to die. The judge had this to say to him. When you got to our county, there were seven Democrats, but you ate five of them, goddamn you, Packer, you Republican cannibal. I would sentence you to hell, but the statutes forbid it. The condemned man's sentence was later commuted to 40 years in prison, which at that time was the longest prison sentence in the history of the United States. He was released after 18 years, due in large part to the efforts of a female reporter named Polly Pry. Pry believed Packer was not a cold-blooded killer, but a victim of unfortunate circumstance, and after petitioning for his release in several newspapers, she finally got the parole board to agree. Alfred Packer was released on parole under the condition he would not attempt to profit from his story. He did not and lived a quiet life in Colorado until his death in 1907. Bringing to an end the story of Alfred Packer, the Colorado cannibal. <laughs>